I want to start this video off with a content warning. Club 27 contains reference to, and an audio recording of, an incident of domestic violence. I've chosen not to play the audio recording in this video, but the subject of Jordan Cross's murder of his girlfriend, Hannah Highmore, is a major topic of the level, with references in numerous places, and I will be discussing it throughout. So please use discretion if you find this topic emotionally distressing. Welcome to Bangkok 47. Ken Morgan has booked the Queen Suite, but has yet to check in. You will find him in and around the restaurant. Oddly enough, Jordan Cross seems completely unaware of his presence. Cross and the class have set up a recording studio in the Emperor's Suite on the third floor. Private security around Cross and his entourage is highly capable. Still, I am sure you can find your way into his inner circle. After all, today is Jordan Cross's 27th birthday. The age when rock stars die. Good luck, 47. Club 27 was released on August 16th, 2016. It is set in Bangkok, Thailand. The primary target for this mission is Jordan Cross, the lead singer of the acclaimed indie band, The Class. Jordan Cross and his influential father, Thomas Cross, have been previously referenced numerous times in the game so far, in references I've covered in previous videos. And now we're finally going to get a chance to put a face to the name. One year before the events of the mission, Jordan Cross's girlfriend, Hannah Highmore, was killed after falling from Jordan Cross's penthouse apartment. The police ruled it an accident, but Hannah's family remains unconvinced. They believe, rightfully, that Jordan Cross killed his girlfriend, pushing her out to her death, and have hired the ICA, and more specifically, Agent 47 and Diana, to take Cross out. The secondary target of the mission, Ken Morgan, is the lawyer who got Jordan Cross off scot-free for Hannah Highmore's murder. He's a professional fixer, who makes problems go away for the right price. Both targets are checked in to the luxurious Himapan Hotel, which will be the setting for the mission, although Jordan Cross is seemingly unaware of Morgan's presence there. The hotel itself is owned by Jordan's father, Thomas Cross, giving Jordan free reign of the place to use it as his own personal playhouse, much to the chagrin of the staff and other guests. Do they bother you that much, huh? Me, I have selective hearing. I can tune out just about anything. Isn't a recording studio supposed to be soundproof? No, 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 it's, it's not the actual recording. No, it's the partying. Last night they were playing some drinking game down on the lawn. So I popped my head out the window and this disgusting, naked, bearded guy just gives me the finger. Ugh, all naked? Well, he was kind of clutching a fern in an area, but look, that's not the point. The worst part is they get to do whatever they want just because the lead singer's father owns the hotel. What a world, eh, Reuben? You know, I am on a working holiday. I paid for peace and quiet, and I am going to get it. Okay, good luck with that. <coughs> Buzzkill. <coughs> Buzzkill. This mission is much more similar to The Showstopper than it is to World of Tomorrow or A Gilded Cage in terms of level structure. Unlike the last two missions, you won't be exploring a vast public space this time around, like the city streets of Bangkok. Rather, the Himapan Hotel serves as the sole setting for the level. 47 arrives in the area via a riverboat on the docks designed for guests to arrive. The first thing you see is the beautiful hotel, with golden elephant statues in front of the entrance. The hotel is bordered by a small explorable outdoor area on three sides. In front of the hotel, as you leave the dock, you can find a bar to the left, as well as several lounge areas, with characters relaxing by the riverside, including this one little nook that I just really want to sit down with a good book and kill a few hours here. Really badly. VR chat modders, get on it. You can find a staff-only supply room here, connected to a small section behind the bar that can be used to sneak into the hotel's north tower. There's a staff-only entrance into the tunnels running beneath the hotel, down further past the supply room. There's also a fountain in this area, but in a surprising departure from the first three levels, there's no challenge to throw coins in at this time. I guess they decided throwing progressively more coins into each level's fountain wasn't that interesting after the third time you do it. If you travel to the right of where you enter, you'll find the outdoor seating area for the hotel restaurant. There's a little beware of falling coconuts sign over here. Look at that, it's great. Beyond this, on the south side of the hotel beyond a garden shed, is an immaculately maintained lawn, with hotel guests relaxing and employees going about their business. If you eavesdrop on one of the guests here, you can hear him bragging about being a professional poacher. Now let me tell you one more thing. You can drop me anywhere in the world and I can survive with my knife and a piece of string. Oh, oh yeah, 
knife and strength. Hell, once I lived off my own urine for two weeks behind enemy lines. It was a secret mission. I, I can't tell you any more stuff about you. Spy stuff. I can't tell you. Well, I haven't really thought about that. In fact, when I come to think of it, one thing puzzles me. Like, I can kill and gut an elephant from head to tail, and I feel no fear. Like, zero fear. At all. Zip. Zilch. None. But this morning, I see a cockroach on the floor, and my whole body just quit. Weird, huh? I guess that's just human nature for you. Well, think about that. More on this guy later. There are more entrances down into the tunnels below the hotel here as well and some pipes which can be used to scale the hotel's south tower. Behind the hotel, you can find the staff-only area, including the staff entrance. Once again, we see the contrast between public spaces and staff areas in the game, in a way that always feels authentic to me. This is clearly the car and truck entrance, as well as being full of supplies, water, beer, food. There's a security room back here, as well as a mishmash of parked vehicles, and even an exterminator truck. One thing that really jumped out to me here was the tile work, and the contrast between it in the areas for wealthy guests versus areas for the working class employees. Look at how pristine the tile is in the public spaces in front of the hotel, clean and maintained. Then look at the tile at the staff entrance, absolutely filthy, with tire tracks everywhere, many tiles shattered or missing entirely. These sort of details serve two purposes, one narrative and one mechanical. It's always interesting to me how much thought was put into crafting these spaces, and this almost subliminally communicates the game's theme of class divide. If the World of Assassination Trilogy is capital A about anything, it's about the way the rich are treated as more human than the working class. I wouldn't exactly call the game political, at least not in the provocative way something like Disco Elysium or even one of the Bioshock games are, but this is still a theme that runs through every level of the games. Even the eye of the game itself naturally focuses on the ultra-rich targets, giving them more screen time, more complicated patrol routes, and more personality than the countless NPCs inhabiting the level. By the end of the third game, the events of the trilogy are being referred to in hushed tones as the 1% killings. Let's not forget both of the main characters of the game, 47 and Diana, are a part of that wealthy elite as well. I have a substantial private savings I'd like to deposit with your bank. Wonderful. Uh, how substantial? Seven figures. Seven? F I see. Excellent. That's not a criticism, of course. It's a natural consequence of the way the game's eye has to focus on the people who are of consequence to your mission, for narrative purposes. But more importantly, for mechanical ones. It would be an impossible amount of work to make every single NPC have as much unique dialogue, unique personality, and unique pathing through the levels as the targets do. And what's more, the games would not be better for it we get these small voyeuristic slices of the NPC's lives, which are enough to suggest a bigger world, and fully realized people. Only a madman is going to spend time admiring the tile work in one of these levels, and compare them between different spaces. But not only does that fit with the game narratively, but added together, the hundreds of these sorts of details are useful mechanically, to help players intuit which disguises are going to be able to appropriately enter which spaces. In any case, this back entrance to the hotel lets you easily access either the main lobby from behind, the staff tunnels below, or the north tower. The Himapan Hotel is structured with two towers, one to the north and one to the south, divided by a large atrium serving as the hotel's lobby. Each tower is four floors tall. The lobby contains lounges, another bar, and the reception desk. When you arrive at the reception desk, you find out that Agent 47 has checked in as himself this time around, or as his favorite alias, Tobias Reaper. Checking in. Name's Tobias Reaper. Thank you so much, sir. Here's your keycard. Welcome to the Himapan Hotel. Welcome to the Himapan Hotel. Once you've checked in, you can be escorted to 47's room in the South Tower. In 47's room, you can use the phone to be treated to the greatest line of dialogue ever recorded for any video game. There's a problem with the toilet. Take care of it. Now, there's a problem with the toilet. I love it. I, I love it. As if you needed any reason to use the phone other than to trigger this truly iconic line read, this will also call a couple of hotel staff members to the room, which gives you a great chance to quickly get a hotel staff disguise. The south tower of the hotel contains numerous public spaces. The ground floor contains the hotel restaurant, 
as well as a connected bathroom. Oh, excuse me, a water closet. Aren't we fancy? This floor also contains the kitchen, pantry, and walk-in freezer, as well as a staff-only area connecting to the tunnels below the hotel. The next floor contains several lounges, one of which has been rented out by the band and is off-limits to the public. There's also another bar here. Going up to the third floor are hotel rooms, including Agent 47's suite. Another of the guests staying in the South Tower is actress Jackie Carrington, who you can hear say, oh, There goes my next ex-husband. When she sees Agent 47 walking by for the first time. Little does she know that Agent 47 has no interest in such things. He gets his kicks above the waistline, if you will. Inside of Jackie Carrington's suite, you'll find it trashed from her partying, along with her latest romantic partner asleep on the floor of the bedroom. There's also an empty room adjacent to 47's own suite, and another guest's room adjacent to Jackie Carrington's, which is most notable for having one of the inflatable alligators from Sapienza inside. There's another lounge on this floor, which contains another appearance of Helmut Kruger's autobiography. This floor contains maintenance access to the roof of the atrium, serving as the hotel lobby, with patrolling guards, which can be used to easily cross over from the South Tower to the North Tower. You can hear some of the guards patrolling here commenting on how security presence has been heightened to keep Jordan Cross and the class secure, and idly wondering if there's a reason for that. Hey, what are we doing up here anyway? It's a hotel, not a military compound. I mean, I know Jordan Cross is a heavy hitter, but this is a little bit of overkill, don't you think? Is there maybe something they're not telling us? Like, are there threats against his life or something? Who knows? Man, a few words, huh? At the top of each tower is a two-story penthouse, and the one at the top of the south tower is the Queen Suite, which is in the process of being cleaned. The bottom floor of the Queen Suite contains several large areas, a dining slash living space, and two side rooms, each containing a staircase up to the second floor. There's also a private kitchen, as well as an office and a bathroom. The second floor has a private rooftop garden, as well as one large master bedroom and two smaller bedrooms, each containing a private bathroom. While the bottom floor of the penthouse is full of security guards and housekeeping NPCs, there's only one NPC on the top floor, a shifty-looking man you can find attempting to peer across the distance between the two towers. If you eavesdrop on him, you'll discover that he's a stalker of Heidi Santoro, the lead guitarist for the class. No, no, no. Chad, man, I, I'm at the hotel. What hotel? The hotel. The Hemipan, where the class is recording. Yes, in Bangkok. I rented a suite. It's all happening. Mr. Jordan Cross, Mr. Wes Liston, and the sweet, cool, beautiful, amazing, talented Heidi Santoro. Think about it, Chad. Right now, Heidi and I are breathing the same air. Now, now, of course, the studio's off limits, but I'm working on a plan. I figured out where the staff keep their uniforms. See, yeah, and... No, 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 Chad, Chad, relax. It's nothing like that one time. Look, Madison Lang was an infatuation. I see that very clearly now, and this is different. You see, I respect Heidi, Chad, as a person, as a human entity. I just, I just want to be near her, you know? You know, just bask in her warm, glowing light. Fine, fine, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I totally get it. It's a, it's a slippery slope, I know, I know. No, no breaking and entering, no stealing pantyhose. I got it. Look, look, I'll just, look, I'll just, um, I'll ride the elevator, you know, up and down, and, and just hope that she gets on at some point. Cause that's, that's, yeah. Thanks, thanks Chad, look. That's why you're my sponsor, okay? Now I gotta go. I, I, th I think I see her coming. I think, yeah, I recognize her elbow. Bye. It's all happening. You can find him searching the top floor, looking for something that will get him into the opposite penthouse, and even hear his plan to steal a housekeeping outfit to get close to Heidi. If you knock him out, you can get the Stalker Disguise, the high suspicion outfit for the level. And this one really is no joke. 
The Plague Doctor or Vampire Magician outfits were basically slightly worse versions of 47's normal suit. For example, as the Vampire Magician, you couldn't get into the auction even if you had an Iago invitation. But it's still safe to wear in public areas without raising suspicion. This isn't the case with the Stalker disguise. If you're a Stalker, the entire hotel will be considered a hostile area. Not just trespassing, hostile. That means they're going to shoot on sight if they see the stalker around. Man, this dude was a master of stealth to make it all the way to the top floor of the Queen Suite without getting shot. I'd be impressed if he wasn't a major creep. Similarly to the mansion from Paris, below all of this is a series of staff areas and service tunnels that let you quickly travel from one side of the map to the other. As opposed to the gorgeous and well-maintained appearance of the hotel above, the staff areas are dimly lit, grimy, cluttered, and just generally kind of gross, with scuffed up floors and damaged walls. Like the staff area behind the hotel, it stands in stark contrast to the pristine facade that the hotel wants to present to its guests. It also feels realistic to how staff areas are frequently used. I know I've been in plenty of unofficial storage spaces that were probably a fire hazard behind closed doors. Beneath the south tower is a storage room, along with stairs leading up to the staff area behind the kitchen, and to the lawn beside the hotel. Beyond that is a tunnel leading under the atrium, which leads to a series of staff locker rooms, and the laundry room beneath the north tower. In the laundry room, you can hear several staff members talking about how guests frequently leave things in their clothes when they're sent to the laundry. You can find an all-access keycard meant for staff in this room, which is extremely valuable, since the locks in the level are all keycard-based, rather than being able to be circumvented with a lockpick. The laundry and linen rooms are also great places to find disguises. There are both hotel staff and kitchen staff disguises available here, if you need one or the other. This is also where you can find a note from the manager, Mrs. Mukjai, describing the occupant of room 205, one Tobias Reaper. The note reads, Mr. Reaper in 205 has requested total privacy. All staff are strictly prohibited to enter Mr. Reaper's room unless specifically instructed to. Needless to say, failing to comply will result in immediate termination. There's several of these notes regarding specific guests throughout the level, all of which threaten termination for even the most minor infraction, which doesn't paint a great picture of the work environment at the Himapan Hotel. An NPC near the note is complaining about working for Mrs. Mukjai specifically. Why are we still not getting any assistance there? They said we would have help by the end of the well, I'm sure Mrs. Mukjai is doing everything she can, and she's always been fair to me. It's your idea of fair. Us down here busting ass while those blood-sucking fascists up there are soiling the sheets with their harlots and gigolos. <sighs> That's not true at all. We have a distinguished guest list. Even the Dalai Lama has stayed here, mind you. You know, sometimes I wish the communists would come back. They would clean out this cesspool in no time. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, my friend. There are three exits to the tunnels from this end, one leading to the front of the hotel, near where you entered, another leading back to the staff area behind the hotel, and a third leading up into the North Tower. Unlike the South Tower, which was primarily public, the North Tower has been taken over by the band, and is off-limits to guests. The bottom floor of the tower is actually in the process of being tented, with exterminators taking care of a cockroach problem at the hotel. Other than the closed-off rooms, and a maintenance room including the ventilation system for the hotel atrium, you can also find Mrs. Mukjai's office. The second floor is full of rooms being cleaned, as well as the hotel security room. This is where you'll need to go in order to disable the security cameras for the level this time around, as it's the only location where you can do so. And it's well patrolled and relatively difficult to do, compared to previous levels. One of the guests staying at the hotel seems to have forgotten their medication, which is still sitting on the bathroom counter. This is a source of lethal poison pills in the level that doesn't require you to bring them in on your own. The third floor is populated by the sound recording crew, along with Jordan Cross's bodyguards. The crew have been partying non-stop, and the floor is completely trashed, with many of the crew unconscious on the floor from partying. You can even find them lounging around smoking a shisha pipe from the Marrakesh level in one room. The lounge on this level is full of sound crew members who are organizing Jordan Cross's birthday party. In order to get into the Emperor Suite penthouse, you'll need to be in one of the appropriate disguises, sound crew or bodyguard. In addition to that, you can hear Jordan's manager, Dexy Barrett, 
telling the guards that the only hotel staff allowed up are kitchen staff, so that disguise will get you through, although they'll be frisked, unlike the others. The Emperor Suite Penthouse is almost identical to the Queen Suite Penthouse in structure. The difference is that the band have converted it into a recording studio, with audio recording hardware and instruments everywhere, along with a large soundproof recording booth in the middle of the main room. There are also catering tables spread around throughout the suite. Unlike the Queen Suite, the second floor of the Emperor Suite is heavily populated, with crew and bodyguards along with Jordan Cross and Dexy Barrett both patrolling here. The master bedroom here belongs to Jordan Cross, with the other two bedrooms belonging to Heidi Santoro and Dexy Barrett. That is the map for the Bangkok level. Unlike the last two levels, which encompassed huge spaces, this is a small amount of physical space, but it's perhaps the most densely packed level yet. Even though the two hotel towers are essentially the same layout, they feel radically different due to how they are contextualized, and this is a good reuse of assets, since it's realistic for hotel rooms and even buildings like this to be essentially identical. Now, let's talk about the targets. Jordan Cross is described as being revered and reviled in equal measure. You can hear NPCs in the level describing him as a creative genius, but also hear NPCs who are fed up with his rockstar persona. Jordan Cross killed his girlfriend, Hannah Highmore, which is the biggest plot point of the level, around which everything else circles. Since the murder, Jordan has become increasingly unstable, listening to the recording of the murder in his room every night, fighting with the band members he used to be close with, and angry about letting his father back into his life in order to make the problem go away. Jordan Cross stays locked away in the Emperor Suite, patrolling between the two floors and never leaving unless prompted. Ken Morgan is much more put together, having arrived in Bangkok on some sort of sudden mystery assignment from Jordan's father, Thomas Cross. Morgan is the fixer who made Jordan's problem go away a year earlier, but now Jordan seems oblivious to Morgan's presence at the hotel, which should make inquisitive players wonder what exactly is afoot. Morgan is mostly characterized in the level by generally treating the staff of the Hotel Himapan terribly, at best talking down to them, and at worst openly scolding them for things like simply not working fast enough for his liking. Morgan can be found patrolling around the hotel restaurant and the surrounding outdoor area, waiting on his room, the Queen Suite, to be ready. Once again, we see two targets here who are working against each other, much like DeSantis snooping behind Caruso's back in Sapienza. And the mystery of why exactly Morgan has arrived in Bangkok is central to the level, as well as the nature of the target's relationship with each other. I don't want to give away exactly where that plot goes just yet, so let's move ahead into mission stories. Near the default entrance to the level, you can find two members of the band's recording crew hanging out by the bar, discussing a delivery which was just made and picked up by another member of the crew. So, I want to get that package for Wes, but reception says one of our guys picked it up an hour ago. Eh, uh, must have been Julian. <laughs> yeah, he's with that actress again, Jackie Carrington. Saw him sneak up to her room earlier, lucky bastard. Damn it! I was kind of hoping the package had gotten lost. I mean, I know Wes Liston is a sucker for all things vintage, but Branson MD2. Eh, uh, says it's the best vocal mic of the 60s. And the deadliest. An MD2 electrocuted Fab Chamberlain on stage at Glastonbury. The model was taken off the market, for Christ's sake. Yeah, I really don't like to put this next to that. Too much voltage turns the MD2 into a death trap. It's happened before, it'll happen again. And let's not forget, Jordan is turning 27. Hey, I'm not the one you need to convince, Grandma. This delivery was a Branson MD2 microphone a microphone infamous for a defect which can cause electrocution if improperly handled. The producer, Wes Liston, is an infamous perfectionist and needed the perfect sound, so nothing less than a Branson MD2 would do. You can hear NPCs throughout the level discussing Wes Liston's infamous perfectionism. Yeah, well, why would Wes want to use a mic with a notorious production error? Wes is uncompromising. Always chasing that perfect sound. He once spent six days tweaking the spring reverb for Noel Wagner's Rickenbacker until Noel had a nervous breakdown and knocked Wes out cold with a frying pan. And this other time, Wes locked himself in the studio with a loaded revolver, threatened to shoot anyone from the record company who entered before the mix was just right. Yeah, well, still, I mean, to, to risk Jordan's life for a particular vocal sound that, that only he and, and a handful of people in the world will ever notice? As I said, uncompromising. Anyway, it's safe enough when you know how to handle it. 
Just don't crank the voltage. All right, well, I'll keep that in mind. The member of the crew who accepted the delivery, Julian, hasn't brought it up to the Emperor Suite yet, having gotten sidetracked with Jackie Carrington. You can overhear two other crew members discuss Julian's luck with the ladies in the bar on the second floor of the South Tower. Man, that woman's insatiable. God damn it, how does he do it? He doesn't do anything. They come to him. Young, mature, the full range. I mean, guys like him too. I don't have any game, not even Monopoly. God, I'm stupid. Sure you do. Stop, not like Julian. I'm sure it gets old. Law of diminishing returns, right? I guess. Hey, wasn't he supposed to fetch that microphone for Wes? Ah, uh, yeah. Hey, if anyone asks, we'll cover for him. I mean, he'd do the same for us. <sighs> yeah, but he won't have to. Life sucks. You can find Julian asleep on the floor of Carrington's hotel room, and you can find the Branson MD2 right next to him. You can also find his clothes on the floor of the bathroom, giving you an easy way to make it all the way to the recording studio to deliver the mic yourself. Unfortunately, Jordan Cross is showing no interest in actually performing until the mix is perfect, and Wes Liston is stuck. You can hear him asking the Young Blood recording crew to give the mix a shot to see if they can get it. Luckily, 47 is a master of mixing, and so by playing a simple minigame, you can perfect the track yourself. Then, waiting until Jordan Cross is recording, you can amp the voltage up and initiate Jordan Cross as the latest member of the 27 Club. Yeah, you do believe in ah! I cannot accept- the bottom floor of the north tower of the hotel is being fumigated, and you can hear a staff member speaking to one of the exterminators, nervous about toxic chemicals being used so near to the atrium ventilation system. Whoa, whoa, relax, chief. I got it covered, okay? Besides, even at very large doses, this compound is not lethal for humans. I mean, okay, yeah, sure, it knock you out for a bit. I, yeah, give you a headache, probably, but, uh, I mean, that's about it. Imagine the lawsuits. Whoa, not gonna happen, Chief. Believe it or not, I've done this before. If you knock one of the exterminators out and steal their clothes, then go to the exterminator van behind the hotel, you can pick up the chemicals being used for fumigation. Then, go find the manager of the hotel, Mrs. Mukjai, and tell her that you'd like to inspect the penthouse. She'll call the band and all the NPCs in the Emperor Suite down to the atrium to wait. This is your opportunity to dump the chemicals into the ventilation system, knocking everyone unconscious and giving you a chance to run up and take Jordan Cross out using whatever method you prefer. If you time it right and wait until Ken Morgan is also in the atrium, then you can take both targets out in one go. Throughout the level, you can hear about an obsession Jordan Cross has developed regarding an audio recording, which NPCs in the level speak about in hushed tones. sleeper. Look, I always have been. Well, I'm telling you, every night in his room, Cross listens to this recording. A man and a woman fighting horribly over and over again. Oh, come on. He's just watching TV. One of those, uh, you know, one of those Scandinavian dramas where the people are having hissy fits in their kitchens and shit. He's not watching TV, but I recognize the woman's voice from yeah. TV. It's Hannah Heimel. <laughs> Cross's dead girlfriend, the, the one who, who uh, fell from the roof? No, the other one. Of course that dead girlfriend. Cross is listening to a recording of himself and Hannah Heimel fighting. What the? That's what? Well, oh, okay, well, does it end with a scream? Dunno, but there's a struggle. Then he stops and rewinds. Come on, you, listen to yourself. You're taking a piss, man. <sighs> well, but I mean, if he did keep a recording of the accident, why, why, why didn't he give it to the authorities? And that doesn't make any sense. Unless it wasn't an accident. Whoa, are you, are you saying that? I mean, come on. I mean, look. Well, I mean, Christ, it, if, if that, don't we have to? It's my word against his, and an army of lawyers. I'm not saying shit. You just did. You just, you told me. Now I have to live with it. Sorry, I had to get it off my chest. Ah, oh, Christ. The rumor has even spread to the hotel staff as you can hear two members in a shed in the South Garden discussing the tape as well. It's true. I overheard some of the sound crew talking about it. Apparently they had this huge row in the middle of the night. Cross and his manager fighting, huh? 
Well, bring on the gossip. Well, I only picked up bits and pieces. Something about Miss Barrett confiscating an audio recording from Cross. Said it was for his own good, that listening to it turned into an obsession. Hannah Heimel's name was mentioned. The girlfriend who died? Yeah, but you don't believe all that crap, do you? That Cross killed his girlfriend. Well, my brother is an officer. Trust me, domestic disturbances don't just happen on Skid Row. The rich just throw more expensive shit at each other. Yeah, good point. You know, we could snatch the recording from Barrett and blackmail him. We're probably sitting on a gold mine here. We're sitting on a powder keg. Cross's father owns this hotel, plus half the world's media. <laughs> Do what you want, but I am not getting involved. I like my job. Yeah, I guess you're right. The obsession has gotten so bad that Jordan Cross's manager, Dexy Barrett, has confiscated the tape from him and locked it away in the safe in her room on the top floor of the Emperor Suite. You'll need the code to get into the safe, which means finding a way to lure Dexy Barrett away from the crowd and taking her out. Once you do this, you can find a USB drive containing the recording. Going into Jordan Cross's room, you can play the recording on his laptop and hear it yourself. The recording is of Jordan Cross and Hannah Highmore arguing, with Jordan shouting very angrily at Hannah, accusing her of trying to control him. Hannah quips back about Jordan's father before you hear her panicking, and then hear loud crashing. Jordan then realizes what he's done and says he didn't mean to before the recording ends. When Jordan hears the recording playing, he'll rush to his room in a panic, confused about how the recording got to his laptop and started playing in the first place, and what the message being sent to him is. While he does this, you can be seated in a chair out of his line of sight. While he's panicking, you are prompted to shoot him, quietly taking him out. It's Jordan Cross's 27th birthday, and there's a surprise party being planned for him. His father, Thomas Cross, ordered a special vegan birthday cake for him from the hotel kitchen, and wants everything to be perfect for his son's party. He ordered a special birthday cake topper, which you can hear the chef in the kitchen complaining about. Yes, I am well aware that the cake topper is missing, but can't it wait? We're tremendously busy here. It's only numbers. I'm sure Jordan Cross doesn't need a cake to remind him how old he is. Thomas Cross. The cake is his idea. Uh, uh, very well. I, I have one of my staff in as soon as possible. Getting a kitchen staff disguise and taking the cake topper from the kitchen will let you up to the party. Not only can you place the topper as a kitchen staff member, but also poison the cake. Once the topper is placed, the party will start, and Dexy Barrett will call Jordan down to the surprise party. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a grand day. We wish you a long year. We wish that to you your day. Happy birthday! Oh, oh well, shit, fellas. Look, I mean, that's pretty decent of you. Don't mention it, darling. Have a taste. It's vegan. Yum. Oh, vegan, huh? All right. You guys went through a lot of trouble, huh? Oh, no, 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 it wasn't us. Your father ordered it. My father? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was real particular. I mean, everything had to be just right for his son's big day, huh? Oh, did he know? Algerian ones that I like. What an asshole. Huh. I don't feel so bad. Something's missing. Nice. Um, okay, thanks for doing this, guys, but why don't we give Jordan a little bit of space now, okay? <laughs> Target down. Next up, Ken Morgan. If you don't poison Cross's cake, then the scene plays out slightly differently. Oh, 
it's, it's perfect, yeah. <gasps> what an asshole! Um, okay, thanks for doing this, guys, but why don't we give Jordan a little bit of space now, okay? Way to go, Colin. Smooth as always. Darling. He sent me a cake, Dexy. A cake! I know, but maybe your father is a complicated man. Maybe this is um, his... This is his way of, of reaching out and, and trying to... Oh, oh, that asshole never reached for anything but his wallet. Right? I'll tell you what this is. This is one giant frosting-covered fuck you. This is Thomas Cross saying, I own you, bitch. He's saying that no matter where I go or what I do, I will always screw up and need him to bail me out. That's an awful lot to read into a cake. Oh, you don't know him, Dex. And I pray you don't get to. Um, I'll give you a moment, darling. He'll be left alone to brood in front of the cake, and you can smother him in it, taking him out. Shortly before the mission, Jordan Cross got in a huge fight with his fellow band member, drummer Quentin Moriarty, which ended with Moriarty quitting the band. You can hear NPCs on the upper floor of the hotel restaurant discussing the famous drummer Abel Da Silva, who has been seen hanging around at the hotel bar. Who's the jittery guy over there? Looks like another one of those rock stars. Uh, that's Abel Da Silva? He's only one of the most awesome drummers on the New York indie scene. He was in Death and Taxes and, and Flat Earth Society. Yeah, I, I like Top 40. Ugh. Anyway, De Silva's filling in for the drummer in Jordan Cross's band who quit yesterday. The record label flew him in and I took him up to the restaurant lounge. Oh, Miss, Miss Barrett, the manager, she's gonna come get him soon. Gee, I guess I should get his autograph. You, you, you don't deserve his autograph. You deserve poop in a bag. De Silva is here to join the class but he and the members of the band, including Jordan Cross, have never met before, and 47 shares enough of a resemblance with De Silva to pass for him. You can hear him complain about waiting on Dexy Barrett to come pick him up. So, uh, when is Dexy Barrett coming to pick me up? I don't know, I just carry the heavy stuff, man. I mean, head up to the studio yourself if you want. No, oh, no, I don't want to seem pushy, I'll, I'll wait. Oh, she didn't forget. Taking De Silva out is tricky. The best way I've found is by luring him into one of the empty lounges as he patrols by the doors to it. This is certainly nerve-wracking though, as there is no good place to hide the body, and it's all very exposed. Once you have the drummer's outfit, you can waltz right into the Emperor Suite and introduce yourself to Jordan Cross and the band. Before anything else, Jordan Cross wants to see if you've got what he's looking for, and asks that you audition for the band. Luckily, Agent 47 has received the expert drum training that every ICA hitman goes through, and is able to perform flawlessly. some kind of machine, aren't you? Oh man, nicely done. Why don't you walk with me, Abe? There's something I want to show you. After you. Once you've aced the audition, Jordan Cross will ask to talk privately with you, taking you down to the roof of the atrium to tell you about some plans. The class, as it turns out, is done, and Jordan Cross wants to start as a solo act, after this recent fight with his bandmates. However, he still needs backing instruments, and thinks the De Silva he just saw is a perfect fit. This rooftop conversation offers the perfect chance to take him out. Climbing the cultural ladder, I see. Good work, 47. So, I like your style. It's very tight, very new way. You, uh, you should talk to Dexy when we get back to New York. Uh, who's repping you? Small agency. Very low profile. You wouldn't have heard of them. <laughs> Old buddies from school, huh? 
Don't have the heart to let him go? <laughs> yeah, thought so. Look, believe me, man. You gotta aim higher. Anyway, so I have this project coming up. And I think it's right up your alley. Going solo? Yeah, that's the plan. I could use a solid drummer. A hired gun, not a partner. Someone who does the job without getting noticed. Oh. So you're interested? It's what I do. Great, yeah. Oh, mull it over. Talk to your people if you have any. You can decide when we get back to New York. Good talking to you, Abe. Morgan is wandering the bottom floor of the hotel, waiting on his hotel room to be cleaned. It was not in a state he found satisfactory when he arrived, and so the staff is currently all hands on deck trying to fix it. If you get a hotel staff disguise, you can approach Morgan and let him know that his room is ready, even when it very much is not. You can lead him up to the Queen Suite, at which point he will start walking around and pointing out the remaining problems with the room, making you clean them up one by one. Ah, uh, see there? A smear. As expected. But take care of it, please. So sloppy. Mm-hmm. Covered in dust. I dare say this so-called cleaning was rather superficial, wasn't it? Go on. Rectify. Oh, calcium stains. Why am I not surprised? After following him through the suite, you'll eventually end up at the bathroom, where he will lean over the toilet trying to find problems with it, right as his bodyguard leaves the room momentarily, offering the perfect chance to take him out. If you've done the mission story before and know what problems Morgan is going to point out, you can actually go clean the suite before you bring him up to it, in which case he'll be pleased with the suite, although still insufferable about it. A definite improvement. Hmm. No visible stains. Well, I am sure there are other minor oversights, but uh, one shouldn't nitpick. The suite is passable. You may leave. If there is anything else I can do, sir needs only to ask. If you do this, you're actually going to miss the opportunity to drown Morgan in the toilet, as he won't bother checking it since all the other problems were fixed. In the mission briefing, Diana mentions that Jordan Cross seems unaware of Morgan's presence at the hotel. If you follow Morgan around, and listen to him talking with his bodyguard, you can hear them specifically mention that the trip is a secret, and that Jordan can't know they're there. Ugh. I never could stand high humidity. This is why I fled London, you know. The cursed dankness. We could head up to the suite, sir. Nice and chill there. Unless chance of getting spotted. Oh, no. I'm not setting one foot inside that room until housekeeping's done. I do have standards. It was pretty disgusting, sir. Besides, Jordan Cross is unlikely to leave his studio. Hopefully, my business with Dexy Barrett won't take all day and we can fly back out tonight. In the meantime, Otis, keep an eye out and uh, I try not to melt. Morgan will also repeatedly ask the front desk if there are any messages for him, each time he makes it to that part of his patrol route. In the north tower of the hotel, you can overhear some of the partying crew members talking, and one mentions that Dexy Barrett had given another a message for Ken Morgan, which he was supposed to bring to the front desk hours ago. Look, you want me to deliver it? Just deliver what, it. mate? The letter, Neil. The one Dexy Barrett told you to take down to reception three hours ago? Ah, oh, right. <laughs> no, I'm just comatose today. No, no, I'm good, thanks. I'll pop down in a moment. Yeah, so you keep saying. What do you care? Dexy Barrett is Jordan's manager. She's not the boss of us. Who's the note for, anyway? She didn't say. <laughs> but he's staying at the Queen Suite, so... I figure he's someone important. All the more reason to deliver his letter. I will. In. A. Minute. By carefully taking the man with the letter out, you can get it and deliver it to the front desk yourself. He called me out of the blue and said, I will buy everything. Excuse me, 
I found this on the stairs. Hmm, Queen Suite. Um, thank you so much, Ken sir. Morgan. I'll make sure the letter finds its right. Any messages for me? Let me check. Um, yes, Mr. Morgan. A letter was only just delivered. Here you are, sir. <sighs> Finally. How are you, sir? Basement linen room. Call me when you get there. Dexy Barrett. Mister? Let's go, Otis. Dexy Barrett finally gave word. We're meeting at the linen room. The linen room. Sex. Hmm. Welcome to the exciting world of corporate underhand dealings. Once you've done this, Morgan will read the letter. A message telling him to meet Dexy Barrett in the basement linen room. He'll travel there and tell his bodyguard to leave the room during the meeting offering a perfect chance to take him out. After waiting a minute, he'll call Dexy Barrett, trying to find out where she is, only to discover that he's several hours late for the meeting, having received the letter far later than expected. This is Ken Morgan. I'm at the linen room, as requested. What do you mean? That was three hours ago. The receptionist said the note only just arrived. Never mind. I'm here now. Just bring me the flash drive, Miss Barrett, and I promise I will be out of your hair. Tonight? Out of the question, I will need to change my flight. I have my housekeeper watching my dog. Miss Barrett. Miss Barrett! Something queer about this. The last mission story in the level is called Tick Tuck. In a staff area behind the hotel, you can find a man working on repairing his tuk-tuk. A friend asks why he's bothering, and he mentions that Ken Morgan asked about buying the vehicle as a sort of rich person souvenir of his brief stay in Bangkok. But the engine died. Well, uh, you're no quitter. I've got to give you that. Look, I can fix this. I'm homing in on the problem. I just gotta... Damn it! Yeah. Are you sure you don't want a ride home? It's not about that. There's his guest. Big shot lawyer fella up in the Queen Suite. He's offered to buy it. This, this piece of crap for like an obscene amount of money. I just gotta get the engine running. A guest wants to buy your crummy old tuk tuk. <laughs> Tourists, right? <laughs> they just love authenticity. I don't know, the guy wants to use it as a golf cart at his Hamptons Country Club or whatever. <laughs> Be my guest, man. His folly is my game. <laughs> no kidding. Well, I guess I can stick around for a bit. You know, for moral support. Thanks. Licensed Mechanic 47 can easily fix the tuk-tuk when no one is looking, and the owner will excitedly run to get Morgan when he tries the car the next time. If you pay attention, you'll notice the tuk-tuk now backfires when the engine fires up, and that it's directly next to a barrel of oil. If you puncture the drum as the owner of the tuk-tuk goes to get Morgan, then when Morgan sits in the tuk-tuk to try the engine himself, he'll be lit on fire. All right, uh, there she is. <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Morgan. Uh, please, uh, you do the honors. Target down. Now on to Jordan Cross. One of the best and most memorable kills in the level is hidden, without any hand-holding on how to execute it. As noted in the mission briefing, Jordan Cross is completely unaware that Morgan has checked into the hotel. As you follow Morgan around, his bodyguard Otis will idly wonder if it's wise to be wandering around the hotel's public spaces, if they don't want Jordan to know that they're there. Morgan notes that it's very unlikely Jordan will leave the recording studio at all during their stay. During the Bugman mission story, though, Jordan does leave the Emperor's suite. And if you don't kill him through the pesticide, and instead arrange it so that the two targets' paths cross, then Jordan will confront Morgan. No. No, you did it! Morgan! You brown nose! What are you doing here? Uh, Jordan, my boy. Fancy seeing you here. Cut the shit, Morgan! Did he send you here? Huh? Did my father send you here to spy on me? <laughs> I knew it! I knew this would happen! Oh, wait. Are you 
two in cahoots? You my father's lap dog too? Oh, and you, Morgan, you flabby sycophant. What's in it for you? This old vampire grooming you for CEO? Is that why you let him treat you like his two-bit errand boy? Huh? Where's your silver tongue now? Jordan, if you will just calm down, I think I can explain. Things are not this black and white. What do you say we stop making a scene and continue this conversation in my suite? Oh, this better be good. Once they make it up to the Queen suite, the conversation will continue, with Morgan and Jordan alone together, making them easy to take out. However, it turns out you don't even need to intervene. All right, get out. This is between myself and Master Cross. Um, are you sure? That's why, sir. Do we know this? Mr. Morgan. Okay, start talking, Morgan. I will tell you the truth. You must understand. It wasn't supposed to go down like this. Your father was merely being sagacious. What are you babbling about? Hannah Highmore's death tape. The proverbial smoking gun that you so precariously kept for yourself instead of destroying the evidence. That's why I'm here. Ah, oh, Dexy. Don't be too hard on this babble. Everyone has a price, and it is usually lower than you'd think. We did not mean to use it, of course. Not unless you left your father no choice. You wouldn't dare. You covered it up! I'll take it down with you, right? You and my dad. You father and I acted in good faith. How were we to know that Dexy Barrett helped you tamper with the crime scene, made it look like an accident? your father. The bribes and the hush money all came from offshore accounts in your name. Don't bullshit me, Jordan. You and I are in very different leagues. Target down. Now on to Jordan Cross. Dad, please call me. It, it happened again. This guy just really loves pushing people off of balconies. Letting Jordan Cross kill Morgan will earn you the Oops, I Did It Again challenge, one of the game's hidden challenges which only offers the title and the image thumbnail as a hint. In addition, you might recall that this is right next to where the Stalker disguise can be found, and if you can kill both targets while disguised as such, you'll get the Smooth Operator Challenge. I'm really impressed by this game's willingness to hide such meaningful content like this behind vague hinting, and letting players intuit what they'll be able to do from the context of the mission itself. This is as interesting and exciting as any of the mission stories in the level, so it's cool to see it so well hidden. It is also the scripted kill that actually puts together the pieces of what exactly is going on between Morgan and Jordan in case the player hadn't put the pieces together themselves, with Morgan being sent here by Jordan's father to buy the recording of the murder off of Dexy Barrett. Dexy Barrett wants to get rid of it, both to get it out of Jordan's hands, forcing his obsession to end, as well as to make what is surely a tremendous amount of money in the process. Thomas Cross wants the tape as the ultimate blackmail on his son, assuring that his son will never be able to step out of his life again, and at the same time being able to keep control over his son forcing him to follow whatever he says. Another way to take Ken Morgan out is by poisoning the food he tries as he patrols into the kitchen. He tries a different dish each time he comes through, but if you're quick to poison one before he's gone through, and wait for him to patrol several times, you should eventually take him out. Jordan Cross's patrol route leads him through the fountain area upstairs in the Emperor Suite. The timing is very precise, but if you expose a wire here and then overflow the fountain at a nearby crank, you can kill Jordan via electrocution, earning the I'm X Static challenge. Sniper Assassin might seem tricky in this level, since one of the targets stays entirely indoors and it's a relatively small map, but open windows in the Emperor and Queen suites mean that you can easily snipe either target from the safety of the opposite end of the map. We've got a fun batch of mastery rewards this time around, probably the strongest overall so far. In addition to the usual alternate starting locations and agency pickups, you can get a machete at level 2, 
a silenced shotgun at level 5, a silenced SMG at level 7, a new sniper rifle at level 15, and a very nice golden silenced pistol at level 20. Outside of weapons, you can get an emetic syringe at level 10, an antique lethal syringe at level 12, which is essentially an alternate skin for the lethal syringe. You can get an ICA explosive phone at level 18, which can be set down in a target's path, causing them to go, ooh, free phone, and then blowing them sky high. Target down. Now on to Jordan Cross. There's even a challenge on this level to kill a target using the explosive phone. Finally, you can get Mixtape 47 at level 20, which is a remotely triggered distraction device that plays Agent 47's mixtape to draw attention. Of course, as anyone watching this series so far will know by now, my favorite part of any Hitman level are all of the easter eggs and details hidden in every nook and cranny. The Himapan Hotel has another excellent batch of these. Let's take a look. During the Bugman mission story, when you're disguised as the Exterminator and send all of the band members and crew out of the Emperor Suite and down into the Atrium, you can go up into the suite. Behind the recording booth, there is a piano, which will have the Blend In as Exterminator prompt. When you press this, Agent 47 will play La Cucaracha on the piano, awarding the challenge of the same name. Once you've finished, you'll begin hearing horrible screeching noises coming from outside the hotel. If you look off into the skyline in the distance, you'll see a massive cockroach, as big as the horizon, slowly crawling in the distance. You can hear one NPC recognize Morgan in front of the hotel, and refer to some of his previous cases, including one where he got a rich young woman off on multiple murder charges with an affluenza defense. Wait, I recognize you. You're Ken Morgan. Yeah, yeah, they call you the brick, right? Keith McKenzie, U.S. Attorney's Office, South District. Keith? I saw you at the Chelsea Whitmore trial. Your strategy was the brassiest thing I've ever seen. The girl burned a homeless man alive, and framed her cheerleading rival, and you got her off on affluenza charges? Stroke of genius, sir. I see. You're, um, not gonna give me the speech about how I'm part of the problem? About uh, how you will never embrace the private sector because you're fighting the good fight, and uh, well, justice is more important than money. Shit, no. The U.S. Attorney's Office is just a stepping stone to me. You don't buy a place in the Hamptons on a state salary. Hmm. Uh, Keith, was it? Uh, give my office a call. Morgan, Yates, and Cole. We may have something for you. Thank you, sir. we Will do. You can hear two NPCs outside the hotel restaurants discussing how bank director Cobb's plane had just been found wrecked. This is a reference to the former bank director mentioned in the closing cutscene of A Gilded Cage. The woman also mentions thinking something strange was afoot with the deaths of Dahlia Margolis and Viktor Novikov. Hey, did you check the news sites this morning? Apparently they found bank director Cobb's plane. No, I, they did. So do you know what happened? Was it an accident or...? Well, that's the thing. They found the fuselage, but the black box is missing. Huh. What do you know? And Cobb's body? Nope. No body, but that's hardly a surprise. I mean, the plane disappeared months ago. Shark probably ate him. 
Hey, who's this cop guy to you anyway? And what do you think happened? It's... but I'm not sure. Mm. I just... Sometimes I get this sense that there is more to a story than what meets the eye, you know? Like Victor Novikov and Dahlia Margolis. What's the official theory? Russian mob? Crazy stalker? <laughs> Come on. Too easy. Why, Lauren? Never think you as a conspiracy nut. I prefer insightful and tenacious. All good journalists are. Now, go be a tourist. I have to read up on all this. Okay, okay. Bring you back a bunch of photos of me in front of stuff. Two women by the hotel bar are also discussing Cobb's disappearance, and how it's brought conspiracy theorists out of the woodwork. Who is this guy Cobb, the one in all the papers? Are you kidding? Where have you been the last couple of months? In Switzerland, splitting atoms. Okay. Good answer. Anyway, Eugene Cobb was director of this big old New York bank. Then a while back, his private jet disappeared over the Pacific. Oh, a storm? No, it was a beautiful day. But according to FAA, there was a mysterious radar malfunction and the plane was hundreds of miles off course. And now, they say the black box is missing. All of which has drawn the conspiracy nuts out of the woodwork. Oh, the Illuminati got him, huh? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I think his successor had him killed. A guy called Fannin? I don't know. He looks like he's got something to hide. Two men at the bar are discussing the events of the Marrakesh level, and one of them has essentially figured out what Zaydan's plot was, and recognizes that it got him and Strandberg killed. Wait, so you're saying the con man got con? No, on the contrary. I'm saying Strandberg was in on it. I mean, several soldiers under General Zaydan's command have confessed to taking part in a premeditated coup d'etat. Zaydan used Strandberg as a lightning rod to justify imposing martial law. Basically, he was puppeteering a riot. Okay, so you think Strandberg was in on it? Pam Kingsley, the GNN reporter who interviewed Strandberg, makes a pretty convincing case. I mean, why would Strandberg confess his guilt on live TV the way he did at that particular moment? He was clearly adding fuel to the fire, almost as if he wanted the rioters to invade the Swedish consulate. And what about Consul Olander's diplomatic beat dragging? No, this was a conspiracy. Klaus Strandberg knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Except he got himself killed, as did Zayden. Mm. So, the question is, were they betrayed by their own, or another faction entirely? Oh, through a glass darkly, huh? Oh, yeah. Whatever happened that day, my guess is, it's far from over. The bathroom scale in Agent 47's room works. If you step on it, you can see that Agent 47 weighs, of course, exactly 47 kilograms. You can see several sanguine shopping bags being held by staff for guests eating at the hotel restaurant. Throughout the level, there are open globes being used to hold bottles of alcohol. This is a reference to Hitman Blood Money, where one of the targets, an alcoholic in rehab, was hiding his vice in a similar globe. The mission contains many, many, many references to the titles of famous songs within it, especially in the mission story titles or the names of challenges. For example, the previously mentioned challenge Oops, I did it again! Which, I don't know guys, Britney Spears and Hitman? I'm not sure I see the connection, it seems like a stretch. I mean, who would reference a Britney Spears song in regards to the Hitman games? Very strange. Zero out of ten, worst video game ever made. I'm not the right person to make all of the song connections myself, so I'll be linking to an article on the Hitman fandom wiki, which lists many of the references in the description. In the Queen Suite, you can find 18 golden elephant statues hidden on shelves. These statues are different from the silver elephant statues you can find throughout the level. If you shoot them, you can hear the sound of an elephant trumpeting. If you shoot all 18 golden elephants and go downstairs, then when you reach the atrium, the lighting will change and strange sounds will begin playing. When you reach the golden elephant statues at the entrance to the hotel, they begin crying blood. A crowd gathers around to watch the strange supernatural occurrence, and if you wait long enough, the poacher I mentioned earlier 
will patrol over to the statues and panic when he sees what's happening. I, I, I realize now, I realize that my gun was just a substitute for my lack of self-esteem. I get it. I get it now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Hey, a fellow guy. See you around, man. This Easter egg is still available in the Hitman 3 version of the level. However, the challenge, I will cry if I want to, to trigger the Easter egg was removed in later releases of the game, as well as the achievement Elephants Never Forget, which is also only available in the original release. The title of the mission itself, as referenced by Diana in the mission introduction, is a reference to the 27 Club, a term for the long list of artists who have died at the age of 27. The mission is set on Jordan Cross's 27th birthday. You can even hear two of the recording crew discussing this in the mission. So he's what, like 25? I mean, I bet he's older than he looks. I mean, the rich always are. He's turning 27, man. Oh, you don't say. The infamous 27. Wait, what? what's so infamous about it? Well, you know, Club 27. Come on, celebrities dying at the age of 27? Like a suicide pact? No, what? Like, random. Seriously, you never heard of this? Dude, it's this strange statistical convergence, right? People who die young tend to die at the exact age of 27. Yeah, okay, but only celebrities? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Normies don't count. So basically, either Jordan dies at 27, or he becomes indestructible and releases album after album of ever-decreasing quality until he's, like, way into his 70s. Doesn't seem to be a lot of, a lot of middle ground with these people. It's either burnout or fade away. The age-old question. <laughs> Only the young dream of burning out. Adults want to hang on and party for as long as they can, man. It's very true. Okay, this one's real, real fiddly to get to trigger. There's a challenge called Looking Into the Distance. I found conflicting information on exactly what causes this to trigger, and I'm not sure if that's because it changed between games or just weird word of mouth inconsistency. But from what I can tell, at least in Hitman 3, here's how it triggers. If you take a sniper rifle into Jackie Carrington's suite, you can, from the balcony, just barely make out a pier in the distance which has a golf bag on it. At some point in the mission's routine, around 10 minutes in, a man will appear on the pier and take a golf club out of the bag and start driving golf balls into the river. Shoot him and you'll hear strange noises including someone yelling four and then the challenge will pop. Boy, sitting there in Jackie Carrington's suite for 10 minutes with a sniper rifle really let me appreciate how chunky some of these background assets are. Look at those buildings. That skybox. Mmm, those are some chunky buildings back there. I kinda love it. You can hear NPCs throughout the level referring to the cross case, and discussing whether or not he did it. For example, two guards in the office of the Emperor suite. Which camp are you in? Accident or murder? Well, it's easy to assume that Cross got off just because he's rich and famous. And not entirely without precedent. True. But does being a billionaire heir make him more likely to commit murder? Actually, yeah. It's called affluenza. An inability to understand the consequences of one's actions because of financial privilege. Huh. Don't tell me you're in the murder camp. Me, I don't buy it. I think people just like to knock him down because he defies the whole starving artist myth. Doesn't seem fair, you know, for someone like Cross to have that much money and talent. Yeah, maybe. But... Thomas Cross still used his media machine to spin the case in Jordan's favor. Think about it. The victim is a beautiful, charming girl loved by everybody she knew. Quintessential America sweetheart. It should have been crime of the century. And yet within weeks, the public is crying miscarriage of justice, holding rallies to free Jordan Cross. You think that would have happened if the suspect was at a Compton? <laughs> Not bloody likely. Yeah. Not bloody likely is right. Point is, whether he did it or not, people like the Crosses can do whatever they want. Still like his music, though. Well, a song never killed anybody. Two housekeeping staff in the lower sections of the North Tower can be heard referring to Ken Morgan and his legal history. 
You know, when he was prosecuted for murdering his girlfriend, remember? Huh. Yeah, that's, that's totally not who I had in mind. But hey, I mean, that was the trial of the decade. He must be in high demand. Oh, you have no idea. This guy, he represents like corporate giants. Cross Holdings, Ether, that Kronstad technology, and Hampson Oil. He was, he was the lead attorney in the Chelsea Whitmore trial, too. Right, the fashion heir who killed a homeless man and framed her cheerleading rival for it. Yeah, yeah, wow, that was quick. That's the one, I mean, he got her off, too. That was his claim to fame. The man's an to god Perry Mason or something. He's also a world-class shitbag, I hear. Huh, now I'm glad someone trashed his suite. A staff member in the tunnels below the hotel is annoying her friend by humming a Jordan Cross song. Ugh, will you cut it out? Sorry. I was cleaning the Baxter's room earlier and that singer from the class, you know, the hotel owner's son, he was rehearsing a song with his window open and I just couldn't stop listening. It was just so catchy. Well, that's great, but I'm trying to remember where I put my key card. Mrs. Mookjai won't like it if I lose another one. Of course, I'll be quiet as a mouse. Shine a light on my doorstep so I can find me my way home. Cordelia already. Sorry, sorry. One of the employees in the locker room is fantasizing about poisoning his mother-in-law. Yeah, no, I, you know, I don't have any proof yet, but uh, I think old Bat's faking it. Uh, I guess we should just be happy that we have a job, right? Besides, uh, besides all that, you can't get away with murder, right? I mean, sure, I've thought about it, poisoning or morning brandy, but I could wait for the rest of my life. It's better to take it like a man, I suppose. A note in the level called on Queen Suite Emergency reveals why the Queen Suite was so trashed that it delayed Ken Morgan from checking in. The note reveals that several members of the band's sound crew broke into the Queen Suite that morning while partying and trashed it. One nice detail is that sound carries through the vents between levels of the hotel. You'll occasionally hear characters' voices echoing from other floors of the hotel in a realistic way. Ken Morgan actually has a remarkable amount of dialogue if you tail him, and will go a very long time before running out of new things to say. If you tail him long enough, these get increasingly silly, such as a call from his pet sitter, or him recognizing Jackie Carrington, who turns out to be his ex. Ken Morgan? Who is this? Mrs. Sanchez? Why are you calling me at this hour? Is something the matter with Pickles? She swallowed... what? A flashlight? How is that even... Well, have you called Dr. Epstein? Tomorrow? But isn't it dangerous? What about uh, infection or internal bleeding? It is Pickles in any pain? There's a light coming out of his mouth? Are you taking this seriously, Mrs. Sanchez? Very well. If that's Dr. Epstein's pro professional opinion, uh, call me when he's on the operating table. Bloody hell. It's always when you're out of town. Good Lord, Jackie, how of all the luxury hotels in the world. Wait, wait, wait. Were you two an item, sir? You and Jackie Carrington? Yes. We met through friends. I helped her sue the studio after season seven of Picket Defense got cancelled. One thing led to another. We bought a dog. Pickles. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Should we go say hello? Oh, no. I'm not going down that road again. Just pretend you didn't see anything. First thing they teach you at the academy, sir. If you break into Heidi Santoro's room in the Emperor's Suite, you can play her guitar. Doing so earns the Power Chord Challenge. You can overhear Abel Da Silva mention that one of the class's songs is titled Providence. So, uh... Anyway, the, um, the first album was just a 
Lightning in a jar. Yeah, I couldn't believe how confident it was. Some fellas I know, like deep indie vinyl hipster fanatics, they insist that the soft currency EP was better. I like their earlier stuff. So predictable. But to me, Providence is where Jordan and Heidi and Quentin really clicked, you know? I'm really excited to be part of this. How's the new material? I only got the call yesterday morning, so I haven't heard a single note. Eh, I like the earlier stuff. I want to briefly shout out the YouTube channel, MrFreeze2244, whose videos were tremendously helpful in looking up how to trigger specific easter eggs and challenges for this video. Club 27 is my favorite level in the first game of the World of Assassination trilogy. More than the canonically great Hitman levels among the fandom, like Sapienza or Paris, this is the one I always think of the most fondly. Jordan Cross is one of the most memorable targets in the series to me, both because of his obnoxious attitude and his absolutely vile crime. The targets we've been taking out so far in the game have also committed horrible crimes, but they've all been very unrelatable or cartoonish crimes. The stories of Paris, Sapienza, and Marrakesh all feel out of a James Bond or Mission Impossible script, while Jordan Cross killing his girlfriend and getting away with the murder because of his father's wealth feels petty in the way we see happen far too often in the real world. Because of that, this level is also where the game's theme of punishing those who abuse their wealth and power comes into focus. Unlike Paris, Sapienza, or Marrakesh, the world is going to keep turning just fine regardless of whether Jordan Cross dies in this mission or not. There's no ticking clock that 47 needs to keep in mind. Jordan Cross is being killed because he deserves to pay for his past crimes, not because of what will happen in the immediate future if he remains alive. Ken Morgan is certainly presented as a secondary target here, but that doesn't mean he isn't a memorable one as well. Learning about his history as a fixer for the rich, and following him to eavesdrop on his phone calls and hear him fix, is fascinating. His terrible treatment of the hotel staff and how they react to him is excellently done. What a dick. Following Morgan around and being forced to clean up little messes as he lectures 47, only to drown him in a toilet minutes later, is one of my favorite kills in the first game. In fact, all of the mission stories in this level are inspired. It's the overall strongest batch in the first game, with each and every one being a fun premise, or offering some insight into the characters and the overall story of the level. Unraveling the story, figuring out why Morgan is there and why Jordan is oblivious to his presence, is compelling, and makes for one of the strongest level stories so far. But more than the targets or the story between them, what elevates this level to being, in my eyes, so perfect, is the setting and execution of the map itself. Setting the level in a hotel gives it a sense of relatability stronger than any other level in the first game, at least to me. This feels like a place I've been before, or at least, a place I could have been before. The only other level that's really captured that feeling to me in the levels we've explored so far has been Sapienza, specifically the town portion of Sapienza, which was my favorite part of that level. There's also something so incredibly novel about being in a hotel and breaking into all of the other guests' rooms. It's one of my favorite things a Hitman level can do, present a space that feels familiar and let you break all of the cultural rules of being in that sort of space. It's taking that idle thought of wondering what might be going on behind all the closed doors in your life, which you'll never explore, and letting you explore the bizarre, the hilarious, and the mundane situations in a small slice of everyday life. The best Hitman levels can all be described in a few words at most. The hotel, the racetrack, the club, the suburbs, the bank. That might sound like a bad thing, like these levels are just a series of gimmicks, but in fact, it's because the best Hitman levels know to present the player with a situation that's immediately familiar, and to use that familiarity to allow the player to explore the idle fantasies that those situations raise. Sitting in a bank lobby and idly imagining walking into the vault, or sitting in a hotel room and idly imagining stealing your neighbor's keycard to see what's in their room. Club 27 is the complete package. It's everything I want out of a Hitman level. A great two-word pitch, perfectly executed with a map that's fun to explore and easy to traverse once you've learned it, two interesting targets with compelling stories and a unique relationship, and a ton of funny and compelling ways of taking them out. After the mission, we see the next cutscene play, titled The Shadow Client. One week after the events of the map, Agent 47 and Diana meet in an airport, similar to how we saw them meeting in the montage that plays after the tutorial levels. Thomas Cross was kidnapped that morning at the funeral of his son, and later found dead of a single gunshot wound. 
Now the picture has come to focus. Thomas Cross kidnapped and murdered after leaving his private island for the first time in years. This was no coincidence, and Diana and 47 both know it. This was no coincidence. Not by a long shot. Thomas Cross had billions in hidden offshore accounts, all stripped clean within hours of the kidnapping. Someone wanted the son dead to lure out the father. Someone smart enough to stay in the shadows while we did the wet work, and the High Moors picked up the check. A shadow planned. Mm. Someone got rich. The contract was just. That was a sound problem. I know you don't care about politics, 47. But ICA is neutral, or as has been. We can't allow ourselves to be manipulated. Besides... It's happened before. Italy. Morocco. Paris. All our clients got their intel the same way. Anonymous tips from a hidden source. Each contract perfectly legit, yet part of a grander design. I don't see the pattern. Somebody does. The board has asked us to chase down this shadow client, and our analysts are closing in as we speak. I know that tone. Someone's playing a game, 47. The question is... against whom? Agent 47 points out that the contract was legitimate, and doesn't see how this is their problem. Diana, meanwhile, sees the far more complicated truth of it. The pattern is unclear, but what is obvious is that someone has been pulling 47's strings in the background for some time, something that Diana doesn't take kindly to. In the last mission, the Shadow Client's existence was exposed to the Constant, and to Providence. Now it's become clear to the ICA, and our protagonists as well. They need to know who this Shadow Client is, and they're done being manipulated by him. The next target they take out will not be one dictated by him. If he thought he could use 47 to fight his battles, Diana wants to make it clear that this was a grave mistake. However, Diana is no idiot. Her last lines in this cutscene also make it clear that she understands the implication of the Shadow Client's interest in these seemingly random targets. The Shadow Client wouldn't be risking all of this for random whims. He's making a move against someone, and it's someone Diana can't see. She's not happy about being manipulated by the Shadow Client, but she's also not comfortable with this unseen target, and both are only going to become more important as the story of the first game comes to a head. I love the shot composition of this cutscene to death. The way the entire thing, start to finish, is a single shot, and how the camera starts directly in front of Diana and to 47's back, then pans to an angle that almost looks like the two are speaking to each other face to face, before pulling back until we end in the same place we began. It's just good, aesthetically pleasing camera work. The next level sees Agent 47 and Diana taking their first active steps against the Shadow Client, as we move on to the mission Freedom Fighters in Colorado. 